Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, this is always an interesting proposition to have a person with dyslexia read an introduction. I will try my best not to mangle any of the words, but if I do, please forgive me in advance. We are very fortunate today to have Sid Chopra with us. Sid is a software developer, entrepreneur, professional speaker. Sid founded LookWiser.com to create a cutting edge presentation tools and training programs designed with the help of leading neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists, and professional speakers. Traveling to over 35 countries, he now speaks on topics such as brain-friendly communication, creating power presentations in 15 minutes, intercultural communication, how to sell an idea. He is, an author, is the author of a cri critically acclaimed quick guide to power presentations and the designer of Look Wiser's Presenters Lifeline, which is the first software system that actually helps presenters research, prepare, and deliver on any topic. If you have a smartphone, iPad, or tablet PC, the apps are coming. Currently, Sir, Sid serves on advisory boards for North Carolina State University and Wake Technical Community College and on the Speakers Bureau for the Global Entrepreneurial Organization, TIE. He has competed nationally, been awarded Toastmasters highest award, and was declared a subject matter expert by the Project Management Institute Global Headquarters. Most recently, he was asked to present to the military's most elite fighting force, the Joint Services Operations Command, as part of a pilot program created by former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Hugh Shelton's Leadership Center. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sid Chopra. Break a leg. <laughs> Andrew, uh, I have one question. <clears throat> what does break a leg mean? <laughs> well, but whose leg am I supposed to break? <laughs> it's just an expression. Of what? Uh, do a good job. Oh. Me breaking somebody's leg means I'm going to do a good job. Very strange. Uh, one more question. Uh, uh, what is this nine yards bit? You, everybody says, I'm going to give you the whole nine yards. What does this mean? It's a football term. It's a football term? There are nine yards in football? I thought there were ten. Well, you have to get the last yard on your own, I guess. <laughs> the last yard. <laughs> Has anybody in the audience gotten the entire nine yards? It's a what? It is a bolt of cloth. So somebody has gotten nine yards? I, in my entire life, have not gotten anyone's nine yards. This is very disappointing. I want to talk to you today about dealing with other cultures. There are people from around the world that are now suddenly becoming put together in a one team, and they may be in all sorts of different corners of the world. And this is going to cause all kinds of problems. You see, the perceptions that you and I have of each other are dependent on so many things, so many things. I had an opportunity, and I don't know why they did this, they scheduled me to speak immediately following the world champion of public speaking. <laughs> now, I have heard of this, uh, they, they have this term, warm-up act. So, <laughs> I, 
I want to tell you that I, I met Mr. Jock Elliott, the world champion of public speaking, and I told him that I was following him. I was going to be following him. And I looked into his eyes, and I saw fear. <laughs> I saw fear. Granted, we were outside, he had these mirrored glasses, and I don't know whose eyes I was looking at. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I saw fear, real fear. <laughs> See, our perceptions of each other come from so few little things. And we will completely categorize an entire person just based on such few bits of information. For example, you have an opinion of me, just far. And it will create all kinds of biases in you. You will wonder why somebody from another country that speaks another language can tell you how to give a presentation in English. <laughs> Many of you have actually grown up here. How could somebody from another country teach you? But on the other hand, if I had begun my speech talking like this, you might actually have a different opinion of me. <laughs> See, it's our perceptions of people that will change the way we behave. And our perceptions are based on such little information. If I was in India, I might actually present that way because I'm reducing one barrier of communication, accent. You see, people are basically the same no matter where we go except when they're not. <laughs> and these two things really mess us up. They're horrible. We think we know everything about a culture. We've done our homework. We've studied. And all of a sudden, we find out that a word that they use has a different meaning because in slang, It's changed. The word gay used to mean happy in English in the United States. It's changed. In India, we might very well say, he's a very gay fellow. <laughs> so I want to talk to you today First, I want to say why you should care about this. Then I want to talk to you about why you should believe me. What you need to know, what you need to remember, and what you need to do. In the handout that you have, there's a mind map very similar to this. You can follow it along, write notes as you like, do whatever you want. Make this your exploration about your relationships. So why should you care? How many of you work in a company or an organization that has other people from other cultures? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody at all? The impact of communication, or more importantly, miscommunication, for some reason, is not well studied. We really don't know what the true impact is. But we know it's there. We know it's there. The projects or things that run over time. The definition of quality is different. What means done? varies from culture to culture. 
And these miscommunications can give us poor results at work, poor finished products, complicate relationships, underutilize resources, lower morale. All of these things can happen just because somebody has a different interpretation. Let me give you an example. Time. Time in the West is different than time in the East. Time in England is different than time in America. Time in India is 30 minutes out of phase of the rest of the world. <laughs> Some people view, and I'm serious when I say India is actually in its own time zone, it literally is. And some cultures actually view a deadline more as a suggestion. <laughs> you know, it would be nice if you had it done by this day. Okay. They're very laid back, very casual. <laughs> I don't know if this has ever happened to you. But sometimes I've run into situations where I will ask for something and I will be so specific and they will deliver something to me. And it will have something very basic missing. Like, please build me a car. Oh, you wanted wheels on that. You said to build you a car. You didn't say anything about wheels. There are some costs, some studies that have been done. Hospitals have lost tremendous amounts of money. The Veterans Association said that they changed one form. Their calls dropped from 1,100 to 200 just by changing one form. The Navy said if we routinely read plain language documents, simple documents, it would amount to 200, 250 to 350 million dollars a year. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever read your credit card contract, <laughs> but I want to tell you something right up front. This one problem has kept lawyers in business since time immemorial. And sometimes the Miscommunication can have some dramatic effects. NASA lost a probe because somebody made a convert, didn't make a conversion from meters to feet. Meters to feet. One number was wrong. And they lost a $125 million satellite. $125 million just because the units were wrong. And I'm here to tell you, it's not getting better, it's going to get worse. When I asked you to all to raise your hand, there was a sea of hands raised. We're not really ready for all of this. Very few of us have an intercultural communication training. Now all of a sudden, our suppliers come from different countries, our workforce come from different countries, and our employees come from different countries. And if that wasn't enough, our customers are in different countries. This isn't going to be an easy problem to solve, but the problem is we can't afford not to solve it. Why should you care? Well, because globalization is going to make a very hard problem a whole lot harder. Now, in my introduction, Andrew, and, and by the way, when I kissed Andrew, I want to let you know something. He has a wife. I know we look really good together, but... <laughs> he was telling me I was preparing him for this because I didn't want to, you know, shock him that in some cultures, you kiss once. 
Some cultures you kiss twice. Some cultures you kiss three times. Some cultures you kiss four times. And I was saying in India, for example, your fourth kiss might be after your first week of marriage. <laughs> and I speak of, from a point of knowledge. My mother will not answer the question of when her first kiss was. To this day, I don't know if you've ever actually kissed. <laughs> we might be adopted. <laughs> and I don't know if you know Andrew, great guy. He's from Chicago. And he was telling me, you know, in Chicago, if a man kisses you on the lips, it's time to call your priest. <laughs> it means he's from the mafia and you're not going to be on this world very much longer. <laughs> you know, we think we know better. We think we know better. I grew up in an international household. I was the first Indian in my junior high school. I was the first Indian in my elementary school. I was the first Indian in my high school. I was one of six Indians in my house. <laughs> Everywhere I went, I had to deal with other cultures. And I thought I knew everything I needed to know. In college, I had an opportunity to live in an international dormitory. NC State has the Alexander International Program. And I wanted to be part of it. And they said, OK, you're born in Canada, but you've been raised in the United States. And your parents are from India. What do we call you? Are you an American? Or are you an international student? And I said, I don't care. Whatever you need, I will become. <laughs> I had an opportunity to meet some people from Australia. And I don't know if you know this, but Australia, they speak English. <laughs> and in North Carolina, we speak English too. So no problems. So I, I was talking to some of my friends, and we were, it was the first day of classes. We were all trying to greet people from different cultures, countries, make them feel warm and welcome. And so these girls from North Carolina came up and were introducing themselves. And they said, welcome to North Carolina. We would like to take you all shagging. Now, shagging in North Carolina is a dance. Shagging in Australia, in the UK, isn't a dance. <laughs> well, OK, technically it is a dance. It's a very different kind of dance. Now, the Australian guys don't know this, and the girls don't know this. But the Australian guys are looking at this. Would you like to go shagging? <laughs> wow! Wow! What a country! This is amazing! They told us about this stuff. They told us about this stuff. Women coming up to us and asking if we want to go shagging. Oh, they are never going to believe this. And all of us, the girls are sitting in the background going, something's wrong. <laughs> no man alive has ever been so enthusiastic about dancing. <laughs> Something is amiss. And much to the chagrin of my Australian friend, he found out that shagging was, in fact, just a dance in North Carolina. And he realized right then, and we all realized right then, 
English isn't English everywhere. A few years later, that same friend was sitting in an exam room. Now, he had been, he had gone through this. He knew all these little nuances and wasn't taking for granted that we, quote, unquote, speak the same language. Was sitting in an exam room with as many people as there are in this audience. And he was writing this exam. And he had a problem. He made a mistake. And he needed to correct it. But he, he didn't have the right implement. So he leaned over to the woman that was sitting right beside him, a couple of actually a couple of seats away, and in a rather booming voice said, Can I bum a rubber? Now, for those of you who don't know, in the United States, we call the tip of a pencil where you can erase things, we call that an eraser. In England, it's called a rubber. Now, for those international, an eraser is how you correct mistakes. A rubber, a rubber is how you prevent them to begin with. <laughs> now, I'm in the business world. And like I said, I have always been a pioneer pretty much everywhere I've gone. I have been the outsider. So I knew cultural communication was all about. It was in my DNA. And I got um, put on a project because of my international expertise. And I got an email much like this. A man was working in a foreign country for a manufacturing company, was doing some translations for me from some of the workers. He gave me a, an estimate of when my product was going to be ready. He gave me some values about the capacity and the particulars and said that the shipment was going to be on time. I said, this is great. Wonderful. I went off and did other things. No problem. Everything's taken care of. Or so I thought. The date came. The product wasn't there. And I didn't know why. I was in a hurry, and I had a business client that was in another country that I was visiting. So I didn't have a chance to follow up. So I flew there, landed, and grabbed a hold of a, a taxi. And the taxi cab driver was talking on the, on the phone. You know, in the United States, we have this thing where you have to have, you can't be talking on the phone and driving at the same time. You have to have what they call a hands-free headset right? for safety. Well, my, sa my, my uh, taxi cab driver was very safe. So I'm thinking everything's fine. All of this is wonderful. What could go wrong? Well, he put on his hands-free headset. Now, I want you to picture what you think a hands-free headset looks like. Now, I want you to see this. Was that what you were thinking? <laughs> we passed along the way a delivery truck. A delivery truck. <laughs> okay, that's not like no delivery truck I've ever seen before in my life. Along the way, I was hungry really hungry. And I told the guy, just pull over someplace, eat someplace that you would eat. Bad mistake. Really bad mistake. 
I love experiencing other cultures, but sometimes there's a limit. He pulled me to his favorite place. His favorite place. And we got up there, and we went up to the way they were cooking, and we saw the stove. A stove. No, I'm not hungry, thank you. <laughs> but I think I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> he said, I know the place. He took me to a, pl a place. And I was in a hurry. I ran as fast as I could to the little shack. And I saw on the wall this symbol. And I wasn't sure. Is this really the toilet? He wasn't specific. He didn't tell me where to go. He didn't even tell me that was the building. Am I in the right place? And so I ran around the place, and I saw this. And I said, aha, I know. I'm good to go. I can handle this. I went in to the men's room, thank you very much, and I saw the toilet. For those of you that can't see, this is a, essentially a very nice hole in the ground. <laughs> this is the toilet, and oddly enough, a nice toilet for a significant portion of the world, maybe even a majority of the world. This is what a toilet is. So I'm turning green, and the guy starts looking at me and says, I need to take a picture of this. So he puts this child down and takes out his camera. <laughs> now there's some connection between this picture and why my mother won't tell me when she kissed my father, but I don't know what it is. I went back to take a shower. I have never needed a manual in my entire life to take a shower. This shower had seven heads and six knobs. I finally, after 15 minutes, took a shower, but for the life of me, I don't know how I did it. In the same country that had one toilet, they had this shower in the same city. I went back and looked at that email that was sitting in my inbox, and instead of saying what could possibly go wrong, I took the word possible out and reread it. He had a date. Well, a date in the United States, when it's displayed like that, means month day, year, right? Totally logical. No, in Europe, it's the other way around. It goes day, month, year. And you know what, if you really think about it, that's more logical than what we do. We're the, I don't know if they really use the English system in England at all. What is 3K? Well, it's 3,000, right? K is 1,000. But I'm in software. K is not 1,000 exactly. It's actually 10 raised to the, sorry, 2 raised to the power 10, which means 1,024. So it actually could be 3,072. Which is it? And then there was this number. I said, well, that's, that's easy. That's 3,500. 43. And the guy beside me was from Germany said, no, 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 no. <laughs> there are parts of, the, of Europe where the comma is actually a decimal point. And the decimal point is actually a comma. Oh. Oh. This is not good. See, 
I had some very fundamental, fundamental perception of reality. I had an idea what happens. And my perceptions, unfortunately, of the reality that I exist in isn't the same as your perceptions of the reality that we live in. It's different. And that's the reason why this is so important. And that's the reason why you should believe this. What should you know beyond the obvious? Well, in my introduction, they talked that I've been working with neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists, neurobiologists, trying to understand how the brain actually listens, learns, and is motivated to act. And I've learned some astounding things and some troubling things. 99%, 99.9% of the people that you deal with every single day have brains. <laughs> Whether they want to use it or not, they have them. It is 100% applicable, or 99.9% .9 applicable. But the problem is, we all have brains, but it's wired differently from person to person. We have perception issues. We have patterns that exist in our brains. We have filters that can block things. And we have biases. And all of this stuff change and warp our version of reality. We have little children that can learn any language, any language. They can make any sound they want. But as we grow older, we lose that ability. There are children right now that if you set them up in front of a computer, a desktop, they will go like this to the screen and go, Mommy, the computer's broken. It doesn't swipe like my iPad. That's what their version of computers are. If you took them to a place where they saw what the old mainframes looked like, these giant refrigerators, they would look at it and say, it's a giant refrigerator. <laughs> now these perceptions can really get us into some trouble. A lot of the world thinks everybody in America looks like the people on Baywatch. Now, being in Florida, that may be true, I don't know, but looking at this audience, maybe not. <laughs> now, we also have some other things that aren't so necessarily funny. A lot of the world thinks of terrorism and the way that we view terrorism. We will look at people from other cultures and sometimes we will see somebody and say, that's a terrorist. They should be locked up. And in another part of the world, somebody else could look at that same person and say, that's a freedom fighter. He is a protector. Problem is, they could both be right. A lot of people have, I don't want to go to another world. I don't want to see another country. I don't want to see all the poverty. Well, I'm sorry to say, we have poverty here. We have poverty everywhere. To look down on another culture just because their version of poverty doesn't agree with your version of poverty isn't right. It's not fair, and it will limit you. The obvious things as far as patterns go is we have slangs and idioms and references to other cultures and jargon and logic. I want to try something for you. I want you all to say, spell your full name as fast as you can, everybody. Okay? Anybody having problems with that? I want you now to spell your same full name backwards. 
as fast as you can. Any problems? <laughs> you know your name, right? You know how to spell your name. Why can't you say it backwards? Why does it take you so long to say your name backwards, spell your name backwards? It's because the pattern doesn't exist. You've been spending, spelling your name all along for the whole, all your life, but not once have you ever had to spell it backwards. So you didn't learn how to spell it backwards. So instead of it being a program, a pattern, you say, oh, I know how to spell my name, play that, go ahead. You have to stop and think, oh, gosh. Well, let's see, my name start, ends with an A, and then there's an R, and then there's a P, an O, an H, and it. See, I have to deconstruct my name to do it. It's not something that comes naturally. So we have all these patterns, and these patterns, in some cases, can mess us up. Can anybody find the mistake here? If you can, raise your hand. There's a mistake. There's a mistake here. There are two of these. One on the top line, one on the bottom line. So many of us cannot see the other the. Because of a filter that we have. We know what is intended, we just block it out. We don't even pay attention. We see it, but we don't give it any credence. We don't consider it. And so when we go to another culture, all of the things about our culture that are part of our own filters and patterns don't apply. We don't see those same things because we've become desensitive to it, desensitized. Now, I'm from another culture. Luckily, my mom is from another culture, too, oddly enough. She did taxes. She had passed the CPA exam, extraordinarily knowledgeable about taxes. She was very qualified, highly qualified, so much so that the IRS wanted to have her help them. So when the people came to her, they had a problem. They couldn't understand her. They couldn't understand her. And my mother was going, what is wrong? And people would stop coming to her. They'd always ask for somebody else that was more junior, less qualified, and she couldn't figure it out. And my sister said, I have an idea. So she went to visit her in New York. And for the first time in my mother's life, they bought a suit. And she wore the suit the next day to work. And lo and behold, her English had improved. You want to reduce your accent? Wear a suit. <laughs> a wardrobe change. Now, there are some universal truths, right? 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 Yes! There are universal truths. Unless you're in Bulgaria. In which case, it's, yes, there are universal truths. Why does this have to be yes? It really doesn't. We just assigned it that, and somebody else could assign something totally different. What should you know? That we are different, and our perception of our world is biological. People aren't trying to be difficult. They just don't see things the way you do. And they can't see the things the way that you do unless somebody makes them aware. So this is where we are. What should you do? Think before you communicate. 
I don't know how many times I've sent an email and just as soon as I press send, I said, no, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I have written so many great, fantastic, amazing emails when I was totally pissed off. And, and, and by pissed off, I mean upset, not drunk. Okay, so I have done that. I've done both, okay? But, but great emails and regretted every one of them. Because I didn't think. Not about what I was saying, but the reaction that I was going to get. And that's where the problem came in. When we're dealing with somebody from another culture, the first thing we have to do is ask questions. Don't make these assumptions. Just because you think you know doesn't mean you do know. We have two ears, one mouth. Use it in those proportions, it will serve you very well. And recognize that the way we think is different than the way other people think. And it doesn't have to be interculturalism talking about international. It could be interculture talking about having a, an engineer talk to an accountant. It's a difficult problem sometimes. They don't speak the same language. Be proactive. If something starts to happen that's not what you intend, do something about it. Don't wait. It will only cause problems and make them bigger. This is called the Gettysburg Tweet. <laughs> Email for the next generation is dying. You think you've had spent all this time learning Outlook? Forget it. You got to start tweeting. You want to talk to your kids? When I mentioned before that we were talking about how the brain works, one of the odd things that I found out is that we have 43 muscles in our face, give or take. And those muscles are there for a purpose to control our eyes and things like that, but they're also there to help us with exp um, expressions. And it was a biological advantage that we had it that way. Because back when we were in caves, we didn't always have language. And we had to talk to our parents. We had to communicate happiness Joy, I don't have a diaper. We had to communicate things. And the only thing we had was our face. Don't believe it? Look at a child, look at a baby. Smile at a baby and a baby will smile back at you. Could be they have gas, but you never know. They could still be, right? It is the primary form of, it, of communication. So you're learning gestures and Toastmasters? This is really important. And it's not about using gestures. It's about using gestures that enhance the specific image or message you want to convey. They have a guy named Paul Ekman, who's a PhD, done some studies, something called microexpressions. And people can look at somebody, and based on the way they have their expressions, the way they organize them, how long they last, how quick they come up, they can tell whether somebody's lying or not. And we have that ability, too. We don't consciously know it, but we can look at somebody and say, there's something not right. When we're talking to people from other cultures, they're looking at that face, too. And they're looking at it, and they're expecting more because they can't understand the language necessary, necessarily. So they want to make sure that your face and your body matches the message that they understand. Be respectful. That's one of the things I have learned in my travels 
that always gets you what you want. But there's a range. There's a range. In India, we have to bow our heads and touch the feet of our elders. I want to tell you something. You don't go around in India touching everybody's feet. You're going to get some very weird looks. And there's another extreme to that. There's only one person in the world that can get by with insulting every single thing about another culture, ignoring all the social norms. And that gentleman is Ali G. If you're not Ali G, you can't get by with it. If you don't know who he is, go into home or a quiet part of your office where no one else is going to hear you and watch him. What's a rule of thumb? I like the word grateful. Be grateful that you actually have an opportunity to meet somebody from another culture. This is the first time in our history of mankind where it's so easy to do that. Be respectful of those that you meet. Admire something that they admire. Because it is very hard to hate something, somebody that likes something about you. Don't make assumptions about what you think you know. Test it. Ask them. Is this correct? I know this. I think I know this about your culture. Is that true? It might be a nuance. It might be only when you're talking to somebody that's a superior. This happens all the time. We learn a language, but it's a very formal version of that language. You don't talk like that in casual settings. Have positive expectations. If you go into a situation expecting the worst, it will change your demeanor. It will change your posture. It will change your facial expressions. It will change your voice. If you have the proper express, uh, expectation, it will be conveyed non-verbally. And it will also change the way you think about the problem. You, the patterns will not be of failure. The patterns that you introduce into your brain will be of success. And you will be more open to it. And you will be more ready to recognize it. You want to find common interests. Build on something that you know. Build on something that you like. When you find differences, try to understand what those differences are. And look at people, what they do, and follow along as best you can. They're your best teachers. If you mimic them, when we were children, that's what we did. We mimicked our parents. What should you avoid? Alternative expressions. Find X. He did. Right there. It's right there. We speak a different language. We're not deaf. Sorry, guys in the back. This is a flag that has some emotional charge to it. Anybody think of this as an offensive symbol? See, the problem is, in a way, to a degree, I'm actually offended that you would think that that's an offensive symbol. See, the swastika is a 5,000-year-old symbol from my culture. You would see it on temples carved hundreds of years ago. On wedding invitations, it means good luck. Why does one person get to change 5,000 years of history? Because they corrupted it. Who's right? Them or me? Well, the answer is it doesn't matter. Because I have to be sensitive to you. If that's a symbol, the swastika is a symbol that isn't going to 
evoke the feelings I want in you, then I won't use it. This actually happened. We had to send a whole batch of wedding invitations back because I put swastikas on them. This was a slide, believe it or not, that was given out in a, in, in a military briefing. Which really makes you very <laughs> unsure. Some other things to avoid. Try to make sure that you stay in line with people's religious beliefs. That's a powder keg. Look at stereotypes as a guide, but not as a rule. Be, rec be very quick to recognize that those stereotypes can work against you very quickly and can be very offensive. Humor is a very dangerous thing to use sometimes. Tried not talking about sexuality unnecessarily. I did, but then again, I'm trying to explore this, so I get to. And don't be condescending. When humor being bland sometimes is easier than being offensive. So what are the things that can go wrong? Well, first, disarm people. Hunt for a, a solution that would work for everybody. Repair when you find a problem. Motivate people to find a solution, not to be entrenched in their ideology, and heal. People are more forgiving when they know that you care. So what should you do? Be grateful. I had a, another ending to this speech, and I have to be honest with you. After the events of um, two weeks ago, I, I really don't feel like giving it. Eleven days ago, there was an attack in the United States on a Sikh community. A lone gunman went in and shot the congregation. They th shot them because they thought they were Muslims, that they had something to do with 9-11. I was in New York on 9-11. I saw the second plane come into the towers. I saw the grief and the horror and the agony of people from all over the world. I saw that in one instant, all of the world was united in saying that this was barbaric. It was horrible. How could they do this? How could young people with potentially bright futures do something so horrible? And the answer was, they were raised on the food of ignorance and intolerance. The Sikh community is a very noble community. It is an offshoot of Hinduism. A very kind religion. Respectful, very honored. So honored that a Hindu family could actually raise their eldest child as a Sikh. It'd be a Hindu family with their eldest child being a Sikh. You don't do that unless you have some regard for that religion. I had a friend, a very close friend of mine. We met in college and one day we were having a little bit of a heated debate conversation. It was an important conversation. And he started walking up to me, and as it got heated, he started getting closer and closer. And I would feel like he's getting too close. I'd step back. And then he would step forward to re-engage, and I would step back to maintain the personal distance. And he would step forward, and I would step back. And we found ourselves waltzing around the stage. <laughs> And he stopped and he said, I have to leave. And he didn't talk to me for two weeks, not a word. 
And then he came up to me one day, and with tears in his arms, he said, why do you hate me? I can't figure it out. Why do you hate me so much? And I said, I don't hate you. He says, but every time I talk to you, every time I talk to you about something important, you disengage. I, I didn't know. In my culture, you have a certain definition of personal space. I was just trying to maintain that personal space. It was nothing personal. <laughs> and he didn't know that. That friend and I both joined Toastmasters when we got out of college and started working in the professional industry. And it turns out, in the manual I was looking at, his uncle was in that first book. This man from Jordan, who could, you know, could speak English fairly well, had an uncle that was one of the best speakers in the world. Who knew? There is a lot of hate, intolerance, and ignorance in the world. You are the best soldiers we have in fighting that war. When you leave here, seek out people from other cultures, learn what you can, and share that with all of your friends, with all of your Toastmaster brethren. Educate them. Make them unaware of the differences that we have, and let them see the beauty that each culture has to offer. And instead of concentrating on all the ugliness of the world, let them see the beauty. You have given me a great privilege to come up here. And I thank you so much for traveling such a far distance. And I wish you safe journeys. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to thank Sid on behalf of Toastmasters International for a fine speech, not only in content, but in, in the quality and the heart, especially on the closing comments, which I agree with 100%. So thank you very much. <laughs> Wait here. Just not on the lips. <laughs>